start with you, Jay. Uh, your assessment of the investment climate in SADC. Well, uh, the investment climate uh, in, in SADC uh, is a good one compared to uh, other African regions, but it, were, it falls way short of uh, the standards that you see uh, in East Asia, certainly, mm -hmm. but in other parts of the developing world. Uh, and there are uh, a number of reforms that need to be done yeah. urgently at the national level as well as regionally uh, in order to attract the foreign direct investment that is badly needed to tackle the unemployment right. problem that it, it suffers from, the region suffers from. I mean, obviously, within SADC, there's something like 15 countries. They're all of varying size, various levels of economic development. And there is a sense that when an investor comes into SADC, things are not harmonized and streamlined. Is that a yeah. fair assessment? That's right. Uh, there is a, a great deal of variation within SADC. There are some countries, uh, especially the SACO countries, seem to do uh, very well uh, by certain indicators of uh, business environment compared to other mm. lower income and less resource rich uh, uh, countries. Uh, uh, and there is a great deal of, uh, there is a need for to harmonizing the disparity, mm. reducing the disparity between the business environment in the relatively better performing mm. uh, countries such as South Africa, other uh, South members and, and Mauritius on the one mm. hand, uh, which have relatively succeeded in diversifying their uh, export base into manufacturing services and, right. and agriculture. Uh, there is a need to reduce the gap between these countries and the other uh, right. less well-performing countries. Uh, Ian, let's bring into the conversation, apparently for all the efforts at political integration, of which we've seen a lot of attempts, apparently when it comes to trade, integration. SADC has lagged other regions. Why is that? Well, that's right. I mean, the, the SADC free trade area was launched in 2008, and, 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 and under that, 85% uh, of intra-SADC trade is now duty-free. Um, but if we compare SADC with other regions of the world, what we notice is that it, re it really fails in two respects. First, in terms of total trade that's traded regionally, um, only between 10 and 14% of, of trade within SADC uh, as a proportion of total trade is with other SADC partners, mm. but more crucially, intra-industry trade or, or trade in parts and components is among the lowest in the world. What this implies is that the realisation of regional production chains in southern Africa is virtually absent. If we look at successful regions in the world, mm. such as Asia, what we find there is that drivers such as China, South Korea and Japan are using regional mm. trade uh, as, as part of their global trade strategies. You know, I think one of the concerns that many people have raised about uh, SADC is cumbersome trade protocols and the fact that there's just too many. You've got, as Mr. Teo was saying earlier on, members of SACU. Then you've got other members of SADC that are also members of COMESA. So nobody's really sure which trade protocol they should be subscribing to. That's right. I mean, there are overlapping arrangements. Uh, and, and one of the key issues is that many of uh, the country's commitments under those arrangements have not yet been fulfilled. So the, what, some of the work that we've done at the World Bank suggests that some of the key policy barriers to increase trade integration at the moment are not tariffs but non-tariff barriers, issues mm. such as export taxes, import bans, permits, quotas, levies uh, and rules of origin which also serve to restrict regional trade. Now much can be done nationally to deal with these issues. It doesn't need to rely on regional agreements mm. such as SADC and SACU. Uh, take a country like Zambia for example which has removed many of its non-tariff barriers yeah. because it realises that these obstacles don't just adversely impact trade but also their domestic businesses. We're also supporting the Mauritian government where they're hoping to set up a non-tariff barrier monitoring mechanism. Jay, yep. when I mentioned to you earlier on that there were different kinds of economies of varying size, mm. it does create a dilemma for the investor because what's happening is investors are seeing southern African countries as individuals mm. rather than as parts of a broader supranational mm. uh, structure. So mm. people come to South Africa because they want it to be the infrastructure or to provide the infrastructure to be a gateway into the region. Mm. Then people go to Angola because there's oil and energy and high returns and then they'll forget about the smaller ones. Yeah. Is that a real problem? Uh, it is a problem. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the problem is that there is, there is a great deal of investment coming in into the region. Uh, indeed, by the standards of other regions, the Southern African region as a whole has attracted far more uh, foreign direct investment on a per capita basis. Mm. Uh, but most of this has gone into resource-rich countries, into mineral mining, uh, basically, uh, and has bypassed the employment generation sectors such mm. as uh, 
manufacturing, uh, agriculture, and, and, and services. So there is a challenge to uh, reallocate some of these uh, investment funds into employment right. generation activities. What does manufacturing mean in a part of Africa like Southern Africa, for instance, where you do have a manufacturing base mm -hmm. in countries like uh, Botswana and South Africa, for instance, but yeah. apparently because those sectors are not competitive, yeah. you're starting to see a lot of protectionism, like South Africa is yeah. very protective of yeah. its automotive sector. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, protection has its costs. Uh, the basic tenor of the argument of these reports is that the more open you are, the better. And if you have to protect an industry, then you better uh, take into account the costs that are involved and weigh them against the benefits that, uh, that, that you see. So we don't want to tell countries as to what they, they should do mm -hmm. in terms of trade policy or any other policy, but we would like to point out to the costs of uh, protecting any particular sector of the economy mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what happens to the rest of the economy and what happens to uh, consumers in general, society in general, and employment right. in general. Uh, Ian, do you want to add your voice to this one? Because you spoke about the various types of tariff barriers in doing business here. I mean, if we're talking about creating factory Southern Africa and some countries are very, very exclusive in how they produce, what are the chances? Yeah, very low. I mean, in order to uh, source inputs from, from regional countries, uh, investors and firms need certainty. And what we notice in the SACA region, for example, is that countries such as Namibia routinely use infant industry protection to limit imports of UHT milk or pasta from southern Africa. Botswana limits tomatoes. Uh, uh, all the countries in the region seem to erect barriers to trade with one another. And, and really, it's an issue of certainty. Go investors need to be sure that these barriers will not arise if they're going to, right. going to uh, promote regional production chains. On this tack, we've seen a lot of controversy arise over economic partnership agreements that some members of Southern Africa, or SACO in particular, want to enter into with Europe. And uh, immediately there, there's a tension because some are saying we want free and um, favorable access to Europe and we're prepared to meet whatever conditions are set by the European Union. And others are saying, no, not quite. We've, you know, th there are different ways of engaging the situation. What sort of dilemma does that present? Well, well it's very difficult. I mean, within SACU, I mean, there's supposed to be a common external trade policy. And clearly, having some members sign agreements uh, with the EU whilst others disagree to sign is, is problematic. Uh, but it's, it's very complex. South Africa already has a trade arrangement with the EU, the Trade Development and Cooperation Agreement. Mm -hmm. but the, and the other countries uh, um, within 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 SACU have, uh, have been reliant on the uh, EU market where they receive preferences under something called the Cotonou Agreement. Now, in order to continue receiving those preferences, countries such as Namibia, uh, Botswana will be obliged to sign an economic partnership agreement. It's very important for their exports of beef, mm. grapes, fish. These all receive tariff preferences in the EU market. Uh, however, an, an, unless a common ar arrangement is reached, um, it could be very problematic, at least politically. Uh, Developing export sectors, yep. that's critical, not just in SADC, but across the African continent. Um, finding our competitive advantages is what they talk about. Apparently, we don't see a lot of investment in this area. Is Yes, we want to sort of find solutions across the board, but we're not identifying what it is that we can do well as individual countries and just direct investment into doing it properly. There are a host of uh, issues, uh, obviously, uh, a host of barriers uh, that require... Uh, a, a variety of uh, uh, solutions, but we can say something about the basics. One of the basic barriers to, to investment in resource-rich countries such as Namibia, Botswana, or to some extent uh, uh, South Africa, uh, Mozambique, and also Zambia, uh, is that uh, um, the, the cost of uh, setting up a business, starting a business, both in pecuniary terms, in terms of the dollar cost, as well as uh, the time that it takes is quite high compared not only to resource poor countries in the region but also other comparable economies. So the first order of business, at least in resource rich countries, is to bring down the cost of setting up businesses, new companies. That's one. The second is there is a severe skill shortage, again, that is more pronounced in resource rich countries than in resource poor countries, but is really quite universal in the region. It is important that measures are taken to uh, close the skills gap uh, in, in both groups of countries. Uh, the third is the provision of infrastructure in general, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, power uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the problem varies uh, within the region. Here, South countries at the moment are doing well. 
they have a reasonably reliable power supply system, but even they are bound to run to severe uh, right. shortages uh, if, if, if they are to sustain high growth rates. Uh, so these are some of the areas uh, that they need to act upon, uh, trying to set up a regional energy market that could stabilize right. the energy supply situation, improve uh, infrastructure provision overall, and also improve uh, small uh, business access to finance. Right. Infrastructure it seems to be the, the most fashionable phrase these days, and we all know it adds 40% to the cost of doing business in Africa. But governments will tell you, you know, we're trying to do something for not launching infrastructure bonds. Um, we have entered into public-private partnerships. There's the Maputo Corridor. We're trying to sort out our ports. We're investing in rail. We're investing in roads. ESCOM's getting all sorts of funding uh, for its uh, power projects. There's INGA. There's everything. But why is it not translating into something tangible? Well, we would urge that it's not just the hard infrastructure, such as roads and ports, that matter, but it's also the soft infrastructure, the policies, the regulatory framework. In order for trade to really happen in order for, for there to be private sector development, there needs to be a business environment that's conducive to growth. And so we would urge governments to look at those reforms as closely as, as, as they're looking at, at hard infrastructure development. And finally, Taylor, we've got to leave it, labour issues. <laughs> How difficult uh, a problem do they present? Because you've got the situation in South Africa where we're told um, not very productive labour, very politicised, high wages. And then, you know, you have um, many other countries having public sector wage bills that are very, very high, and also similar issues around productivity, skills. Well, these are all real issues. I, I'm not saying that they, they are not important. They are quite important. Uh, the question is what can be done about them. Uh, I, I can't say at this point exactly what can be done. Problems vary from country to country. Uh, yeah. I, I can say that uh, the region as a whole doesn't have uh, uh, labor regulation systems that are any more onerous compared to other regions, but that's not the issue. The issue is uh, how important they are relative to the needs of the region, and both labor regulation is an issue that needs to be looked at, uh, okay. including as to how it impacts on productivity and, and wages, and the skills certainly are mm. a, a major bottleneck at the moment. Uh, into which the governments have put a lot of money, but without apparently little yeah. success, uh, and that needs to be, to be uh, looked at again. Okay.